in one minute, please. Okay, may I have your attention, please? May I have your attention, please? May I have your attention, please? Okay, thank you very much for being prompt in uh, returning so that we can get started this afternoon within reasonable time. <laughs> I do apologize for the delay, but uh, if I could just have everyone's attention and people could settle down, I'd like to start. Ladies and gentlemen, we, may we have your attention, please. That good old Irish voice. <laughs> uh, let me uh, just uh, take care of a, a one or two uh, kind of leftover issues from the morning. A number of people have asked me if the presentations will, and the videos will be available on the website. Yes, you will find them on the Global Partnership website. Now, moving right into the session three, which is, I think, a session that promises to deliver some very interesting outcomes uh, in terms of building an inclusive post-215 development agenda for children. Now, I would like to introduce the moderator for this session. I'm waiting for people to give me their attention, please. Can we all join as one? Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to introduce the moderator for this session and uh, the co-moderator. Uh, Richard Morgan. Many of you, I'm sure, in this room have come into contact with Richard Morgan over the past 25 years that he's dedicated his life to improving the lives of children with UNICEF and with government. He uh, has worked in, at the country office level, at the regional office level, and at headquarters. He was, uh, before taking on the post that he has now, which is special advisor on the uh, post-2015, 2015 Development Agenda for Children. He uh, was the director of the Division of Policy and Practice. I served under him, and I can ensure you that he's someone who knows what he's talking about, and he knows how to deliver. So without any further delay, please let me call Richard Morgan, a dear colleague, to the podium. Thank you. Good afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, boys and girls, men and women. I uh, first of all like to say it's, it's been an honor to us to co-moderate this uh, session uh, together with Jenny Nielsen. Uh, I want to start just by um, summarizing what we hope will be the uh, outcome of this afternoon's first main session. Um, we hope that you as participants and partners will be able to derive key elements of the action plan for the Global Partnership on Children with Disabilities for the next two years, that is 2013 to 2015. We have, as you know, already had your inputs uh, from a first uh, online survey and we've clustered your uh, comments into three main themes of how to move forward uh, on the action plan. Three strategic areas. Firstly, how governments can strengthen their commitment and engagement in promoting an inclusive post-2015 development agenda. 
inclusive of persons with disabilities, both at the national level and global level. So the first strategic area is around government's action, action by governments. Secondly, how participation and the engagement of children and young people with disabilities can be enhanced. How can children and young people with disabilities get more and more deeply involved with the uh, design and implementation of the new agenda? And thirdly, how can public opinion be influenced in favor of the rights of children with disabilities through awareness raising campaigns and similar means? So one strategic area is around government action, the second around the participation of children and young people with disabilities, and third, how partners can influence uh, the new agenda through uh, awareness raising. I think those of you who have uh, participated from the beginning of the meeting know that there are cards available. In fact, two types of written inputs uh, are at your disposal. Firstly, the postcards, which are being collected during the course of, of the event uh, and will be synthesized and by the uh, Secretariat and mailed back to you. And secondly, for this session and the afternoon, there are jot down cards, cards for jotting down any ideas, comments, suggestions that you may have that the Secretariat can also analyze and map. So out of this session, we hope to get collectively some very clear directions of what the action plan might look like going forward for the partnership based on these three strategic areas that I've mentioned. And how then uh, collectively we may, may take practical action uh, in each of those three strategic areas. Um, as I said, it's a great honor to be here. And my first task, I'm in the fortunate position of having more than one boss in my current job. Um, my first task is to introduce one of my two bosses. Um, and it, in a way, it's an interesting transition from me as a senior advisor on post-2015 for UNICEF to our UN-wide, one UN special advisor on post-2015. That is Ms. Uh, Amina Mohammed. Um, Amina is the Secretary General's uh, Special Advisor uh, on the post-2015 agenda. She represents the entire UN system and leads us in our support to the global community, including member states and other partners, in the development of the new agenda. Um, before Amina took up this post, uh, I think 14 months ago now, um, she was uh, the senior advisor to the president of Nigeria for the Millennium Development Goals and the implementation uh, of the uh, MDGs in Nigeria. Um, she also was the, was the chief executive officer and founder of the uh, think tank called the Center for Development Policy Solutions uh, and has been working and, and active in different areas of development for over three decades. So um, in order to give our keynote uh, uh, address, and with very little time to do it, but I know Amina is equal to the task, more than equal, um, let me introduce Amina Mohammed, the Secretary General's Special Advisor on post-2015. Thank you very much, and I'm, I'm really delighted to be here today, and much more especially, um, and, and thank you, Nisef, for inviting me, but this is times like these when you're sort of connecting with reality, and, and often we go through meeting after meeting and trip after trip um, around the world, and um, very often it's from a hotel room to an airport to another conference, um, and it's times like this that we get to, to connect with reality, and I hope I will hear your voices, so that reinvigorates us to do um, what we do and why we do what we do every day. Um, we're very clear that this aspect um, of inclusion in the uh, post-2015 development 
onset when we said that we were not going to have a prescription as we had with the MDGs. We were going to have a conversation about the world people want and we're going to take that conversation and put those voices into the various reports until we fed an intergovernmental process as best we could to have a framework that was about everyone, leaving no one behind, um, and was very specific um, at country level for the impact that it needed to have. And it's a tall order when you're talking about an intergovernmental process and you want to open up this conversation to the world, um, especially for those who've never had the opportunity to be part of that conversation. Uh, so the challenge for us over this last year has been to see how best we could do that. And I think as we come tomorrow um, to the General Assembly special event on the MDGs and post-2015, we'll see an array of reports and outreach that the UN have participated in, either through the system itself, which UNICEF is a very big part of, um, through the private sector, through science and academia, through civil society, all of that really coming together to sort of shape some of the contours we think we should have um, going forward um, and uh, uh, informing the intergovernmental process for the next development agenda. I think that if we're to realize that, um, certainly the inclusive growth and, and ensuring equal opportunities for all, um, the business as usual that we've had over the years won't work. And the MDGs, certainly for me, in the very beginning, um, I didn't think they were a very good idea. I was doing education for all, and we had these six goals. Um, by the time the MDGs came along, it was one and a bit. So I really thought that I had been shrunk. Um, but when I got the responsibility of um, engaging with the MDGs and trying to implement them in my country, it suddenly became very clear that we, even as minimalist as I thought they were, we hadn't got anywhere near achieving um, the very basics. And, and that really was so important to a foundation um, for everyone. And uh, I think it's given us an opportunity to integrate a number of issues that should never have been siloed in the first place, uh, but also to get a, a reality check on how far we are away from the human rights agenda um, that we all stand for in the United Nations. So I think the, the MDGs have been quite successful to bring to the fore. It was not a framework that was legally binding. It was compelling. It did move and mobilize resources, political will, to make a difference. But as I said here a few days ago in this very room, um, we can argue whether the glass was half full, quarter full. Um, we still have some to fill. The important thing is that it is full sum that gives us the reason why we can talk about a successor framework in which all of us have a part to play. And I think it's that part that we want to ensure um, you push the boundaries, uh, you make those demands, you are heard, and that we give the quality that we need to the next development agenda. So the future strategy must target the most marginalized groups and focus on eliminating circumstance-based inequalities. Defining this new framework is, is pretty daunting, but it is inspiring and it is a historic task for not just the United Nations, but the member countries themselves. We hope that we will be able to take what we say here to the country level and implement it. It isn't for want of resolutions um, or commitments that we are not doing what we're supposed to be doing. We know that um, we've got the, si the six conference of the state parties to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And recently, our high-level meeting has um, reaffirmed many of the resolutions that we've had to try to bring um, uh, the, the actions that we need to this agenda. Um, but it has, it has taken time for us to implement. Um, I think UNICEF, uh, I, I certainly was very much a part of trying to take the Child Rights Convention to the country level to get acts uh, put in place and then to try to um, uh, uh, put them to work. Extremely difficult. In fact, in my country, I can say it's a federation of 36 states and not all states have signed on even as yet. But according to the World Report on Disability, a billion people, that's 15% of the world's population, have a disability. And 80% of them live in our developing countries, and at least one in 10 are children. That's extremely worrying. Um, and, and I think these figures sometimes mask the, the reality of it. We, we don't, they seem so abstract, and that we forget to put the faces behind them, which are in, in the hundreds of millions. One widely used to estimate from 2004 some 93 million children uh, age 14 or younger living with a disability of some sort. Although high, the numbers are unfortunately either outdated or unreliable. And I think that the appalling lack of data, and, and we, we spoke to this in, in some of the work that we've done over the last six months, 
um, just leaves people behind. If you don't know where everyone is, how are you possibly going to know how to target them and bring them into the mainstream? Um, I remember this being a discussion when we were talking about being inclusive in Nigeria, targeting children for education and for health in my country. And one of the questions I asked was, so where are they? Do we actually know? They, they gave me a figure and I said, well, where are these children? And we weren't able to say that. We gave survey after survey, uh, we gave projections, um, but you know, which local government are they in? Which town or city are you finding them? They were faceless. Um, and that really began the long, hard road to getting a baseline um, and I was presently surprised yesterday at the Disabilities High Level event when colleagues of mine from Nigeria stepped up and said, here's the baseline report for those with disabilities in Nigeria. That's years later, some five, six years later. But we have it, and as I flicked through, the way in which it, the, the, the data was disaggregated, for that alone, the policymaker, a politician looking at that data and seeing the specifics of the types of disabilities and where they are, that really is a compelling message for anyone to want to say, well, I've got to do something about that. It really took the mask off faceless people uh, for us. So the, the importance of data and getting that there is going to be very, um, it's going to be key to this. We know that poverty and disability are inextricably linked. They reinforce each other and contribute to increased vulnerability, stigmatization, and indeed children who are poor are more likely to become disabled through poor health care malnutrition, lack of access to clean water and sanitation, and really dangerous living conditions. And once disabled, they're more likely to be denied basic resources, which would even mitigate or prevent, um, or prevent even poverty. Children with disabilities are also among those most neglected and marginalized children. They experience widespread violations of their rights, face significant challenges in their daily lives, including discrimination, limited access to basic services, their exclusion and invisibility serves to render them uniquely vulnerable, denying them respect for their dignity, their individuality, and even their right to life itself. Over the past two decades, however, disability has been increasingly conceptualized and addressed as a human rights issue. Children with disabilities are entitled to all rights guaranteed to children under the Convention of the Rights of the Child and are also specifically mentioned in the Convention of the Rights of the Persons with Disabilities. In line with this and a strong push for the fulfillment of human rights and dignity that has served as a foundation for the consultations, the post-2015 framework, we continue to push for this to be a major issue when it comes to defining the uh, sustainable development goals of the intergovernmental process. The report of the Secretary General has clustered five, six key elements, I would say. I'll speak to the last one, but the five key elements, that we have a universal agenda, um, that we're not just talking about North and South and that everyone matters. And I think this is a very big agenda for those living with disabilities. Um, and, and that means that we have to look at countries um, with different levels um, of uh, uh, um, ability to address that situation. But it is isn't a universal agenda. Um, that we're looking at sustainable development. So when we speak to the issue of persons with disabilities, we're talking about people accessing an economic livelihood. We're speaking about the environment agenda and social inclusion. And that as an integrated whole, if we speak about everyone, then everyone needs um, more specific uh, uh, solutions to the problems that we have. And I think that it's important with the sustainable development agenda and the universal agenda that while we've got global ambitions, that we really work on how we target these to the country level and that we put in a really robust set of metrics that shows us how we are making our steps, whether they're baby steps or giant steps towards achieving those targets and goals, but that we put a credible set of metrics in place. Um, targeting is going to be uh, pretty difficult. Um, it should be across all uh, the priorities of the next development agenda. Um, and I think that that's where we have work to do um, not necessarily in bringing that expertise to the global level to fit it in here, but how do we do that at the national level? How do we make sure that when we take this agenda to the national level, that it is actually one that they can implement because they have been in sync with that discussion and know that these are the priorities from the, from the grassroots level. The economic transformation agenda has been an important one. It is amazing how much the, uh, we talk about the youth bulge and we talk about young persons, children. Um, again, the ability for people to be empowered so that they can take care 
um, of everyone in the community and that there are the resources available to make sure um, that we're all empowered in, in one way or another. It also means that we need to look at infrastructure, infrastructure that helps everyone um, and that, that puts a, a big lens on um, the different uh, uh, uh, aspects that we have to address. Uh, we saw, started right at the beginning talking about the right space to gender. Um, and in this report, a, dignity, a life of dignity for all that the Secretary General puts in tomorrow, the governance um, element has been pretty big on the agenda because we missed it really on the MDGs. I'm not sure that we missed it, but somehow it never was something that we realized was um, so important to many of those MDGs on health and education, water and sanitation, um, gender rights. But this time we are saying that um, human rights are front and center, but we need the institutions, we need the capacities, we need access to justice, all of those have to be invested in. It's not an investment, I can tell you, at the country level that a politician will make easily. They're there for four years. They want to see the dividends of democracy. That is usually what you can touch and feel. So they'd much rather build a hospital, a school, a university, a couple of roads, but investing in institutions that will deliver service in human resource capacity to address um, a service delivery is a very difficult one. It's long term. They can't touch and feel it. And, and we need to make that a point that all the bricks that we put up without the mortar will not hang together. And the governance agenda really is the mortar for the bricks that we want to put in place. Um, this is even more especially as we look at the um, conflict agenda. Uh, many of the environments that we see today, um, countries that are either coming in or going out of conflict, children and women are the most vulnerable in those, those countries. When we deal with the big issues of migration, this is another issue for children. Um, and we often get this is, is lost um, on the disabilities agenda. The uh, means of implementation is going to be extremely important. It always is more expensive to take care of that last run. And I believe that if we start investing with the bottom level of those most vulnerable, voiceless people that don't have a chance, we start there and measure our success by how well we do at that level, then I think we can talk about giving people a life of dignity for all. But if we start at the top and work our way down, I think we all know that that's not going to happen. I think when we talk about grassroots up, I think even in our communities, the most vulnerable have to get the first attention. There should be more, no poor relation in the family. But the means of implementation will be difficult. We will require considerable amount of resources um, from a domestic budget, from country budgets, and there are competing demands on, on a daily basis. So when we talk about making the investments for a governance agenda, it is to improve the systems that those resources can be put to good use, that we can have good tax systems, that when taxes come in there from businesses that we're encouraging to invest in our countries, that we can properly harness them and deliver them to where the spend needs to be most. Last but not least, and I have to say that as I've gone through this last year of this conversation, what concerns me most is that with a much more complicated agenda coming forth, the poverty agenda was one thing, but to say we want to do a three-in-one, the economic, the environment, um, and the, the social agenda, and address poverty at the core of it, um, that's much more complicated. For the UN, it's complicated, I'm sure, from UNICEF and UNDP. How we really come together delivering as one was a challenge, but delivering as one around sustainable development, this we have the high-level political forum to try to help make us more coordinated and coherent. But it struck me that if we're having problems, what about those with less capacity at the country level? So how in 2015 are we going to come down to that level and really see partners in civil society, in business, in government structure themselves to deliver an agenda where children, uh, where the disabilities agenda is, is mainstreamed in what we do? And I think that this is, um, and this is really beyond the rhetoric. I can say to you how many places you've seen disability in the reports we've received from SDSN or the high level panel or even the Secretary General's report. But how does that actually unpack itself into a plan that can be budgeted for and implemented um, at, the, at that level? So I'd like to say that um, I really uh, believe that this is a conversation we've started. The challenge is that now that we've got this on the agenda, how to make sure it stays, how to keep the momentum, the voices loud, the actions loud, um, to ensure that this is something that we can carry forward and that in 2015, we just continue implementation at the country level. Thank you.
Thank you, Amina. We're very grateful to Amina Mohammed. I can't think of another day when uh, Amina must be more busy, unless it's tomorrow. But uh, today, if not the busiest day of the year, it's the second busiest day, day of the year. So we're really thankful, Amina, that you came, joined us, and, and spoke so eloquently and powerfully to this issue. Uh, I, I should have said Amina Mohammed was a member also of the Secretary General's high-level panel on post-2015, wherein the very strong recommendation as a transformation to our world was one of them, uh, leave no one behind, that Amina referred to. And I think very much in line with UNICEF's thinking is also the notion that those who are most excluded should be put first in the ways in which the new agenda is implemented. Putting the last first and making sure that those who have been left behind are not left to last for another 20 or 30 years is going to be crucial. Before I hand over to my co-moderator, um, we're going to show a short video um, that has been produced by Plan International, uh, including Plan Australia, Plan Ireland, Plan Sierra Leone, and OSAID. And this uh, video is called Listen Up, Children with Disabilities Speak Out. It's, it's about five minutes. So I think this will be a, a nice way of bringing the voices of children into our midst. It is important as children with disabilities and as girls to be able to talk. As children with disabilities, we know how we feel. That's why it is important for us to be heard. I got polio, I lost my friends. My parents left me while they worked on the farm. I was alone. Girls with disability in my community who are not at school fall pregnant to men. The men deny responsibility. The girls are left to deal with this alone. Sometimes when I am left alone at home or my friends leave me, I get bullied because I have polio and I am unable to run. On my first day at school, I was not happy because I lived with a disability. I was alone. I was unable to walk. The other children left me alone and went out to play. The toilet at my school is not disabled friendly. There are times when I go there, everything is messed up and dirty. I have to get out of my wheelchair and place my hand on the floor. It makes me unhappy and discouraged. My older brother says to me, Philip, go to school. If you become educated, other community members will realize that even though you have a disability, you can do something. When I started school, the teachers called an assembly for all the pupils in the school and said, this is a friend of yours, she's now one of the members of the school, so consider her one of your friends too. Don't be afraid of her, she's like you, her condition is not a risk. So from then, they started playing with me, I started to become happy, I started having friends. I think it is important for children with disability like the hearing impaired and vision impaired to go to school. That is why they should have training for teachers. When I complete school, I want to be president. I will build houses for people with disabilities so they are not on the street. I will also build schools for them so they can become educated like me. I want to be a nurse. I will treat people with disabilities and I will treat them for free. I want to be a doctor. Once I am educated, I will return to my community and build clinics to treat people. When I am a lawyer, I will encourage and support children with disabilities to get an education so they can look forward to their future. Whether or not we have a disability, we are all human beings. We all have the same human rights.
I think that was an excellent video and a, and a good uh, reminder as well as a quite emotional uh, experience for us to hear from those children. Um, I noticed Irish Aid was credited there too, so let me thank, I didn't before, Irish Aid, Plan International and Aus Aid for helping to contribute and to bring the voices of those children to us. Um, the next uh, segment of the session is going to look in a bit more depth at the three strategic themes that were developed uh, with your inputs and the clustering of your inputs. Uh, as I mentioned before, these are around what government action should be, how we can mobilize and advocate with and for children with disabilities, and thirdly, how we can enhance the voices and participation of children and young people with disabilities in the new agenda. And I'd like to introduce my co-facilitator or co-moderator for, for this next session, um, Jenny Nielsen. I've had the pleasure of uh, working with during the uh, preparatory period for this session. And Jenny is the president of the World Federation of Deaf the youth section of the World Federation of Deaf, and uh, also um, works with and is a member of the Human Rights Watch Advisory Committee. So, Jenny, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you, Richard. Thank you. I, I, yes, I am co-moderating this event, and I'm glad that UNICEF gave me this opportunity to be here with you today. I hope that we'll have an active discussion about what we can do for the action plan. So we do have three very inspirational speakers here today, and hopefully they will inspire you to start thinking about how we can find some key actions for the different activities and how we can make these thoughts, actions, into part of our action plan. So the first speaker I'd like to introduce is Inga Marta. Thorkildsen, and she is the Minister of Children, Inclusion, and Social Equity in Norway. And so she's going to speak about how governments can enhance their commitment to accomplish having children with disabilities involved in the agenda. So thank you. Inga? Well, thank you very much, uh, and uh, co-chairs and ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor for me to be here. It's been very inspirational and moving to be here as well. And I've learned a lot, and it's made me feel like I want to do more to make a more inclusive world. And I want also to thank the UNICEF for facilitating the Global Partnership on Children with Disabilities. A huge challenge lies ahead of us, ensuring that children with and without disabilities enjoy the same opportunities and rights. This has to do with equality, human rights, development, dignity, and let's call it common sense. So much waste of human resources valuable to all of us in our world today. We got some powerful examples of this in the earlier session as to what we might have lost uh, if the speakers that we listened to earlier didn't have their education and could make their voices heard. Yesterday, the historic UN high-level meeting agreed upon including persons with disabilities in all development. Many good speeches were held and promises made, but words and promises can only get us that far. Now it is the time to act. As Ban Ki-moon himself so specifically has spelled out, there can be no development if development goal and actions leave out one billion people in the world that is neither sustainable nor a basis for development. We know the devastating facts. 
children with disabilities are the last li in line for resources, health, services, and education. They are subject to stigmatization, discrimination, and abuse, as, like we just saw. During disasters, crises, and conflicts, they are the last to be reached by relief workers. Children with disabilities, especially girls, are more often victims of violence and abuse, but often we don't speak about it. Children with disabilities account for a third of the world's children not going to school. So much waste of resources, so much injustice. Education is the key to prosperity and a safer, more independent future for every child. It opens up opportunities for inclusion in society and for earning a living as an adult. All national education schemes must include children with disabilities and be accessible to them. It is impossible to reach the MDGs on education and poverty without including these children in education schemes. Ms. Alambuja, the speaker from Uganda that we heard just some minutes ago, she made an important uh, point. Everyone would like to have a voice, she said. Children, that, that counts for children as well as for adults, those with as well as those without disabilities. In Norway, this has been one of my main initiatives as a minister, to let the voices of children be heard. This has to do with respect. It has to do with dignity. It has to do with democracy. It has to do with safety, feeling safe for these children, to give them information to know about their own future. It has to do with quality of the services that we provide, because they're experts in their own lives. Norway has for many years pursued inclusive disability policies. Clear policies and plans and sound methods for measuring results are vital to reach results, together with a proper, a proper legal framework. This takes political will, and we must ensure structured, regular cooperation with the disabled people's organizations. Nothing about us without us, of course. International cooperation is a cornerstone in the CRPD and must support national obligations and efforts. Norway will give priority to the fields of health, education, gender equality, and humanitarian programs in this connection. Monitoring, statistics, and indicators are core instruments. In our dialogue with grant recipients, we will seek to raise awareness of and enhance reporting on efforts to protect and promote the rights of persons with disabilities. Norway will continuously work to include persons with disability in the post-2015 agenda. Let's work together. Together is the only way. And I will also say that uh, outside there in the hall, you can find this brochure, which uh, uh, sums up what uh, is Norway's international efforts to promote the rights of persons with disabilities. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's been very inspirational. Thank you very much for your comments. And really, these are good comments to mention, including DPOs or disabled person organizations in, a, in the discussion. And so I appreciate that. Now I'd like to introduce another person, Fatima Sagin. And she's the Minister of Family, Social Policy. Policies of Turkey. Thank you. Sayın İş Başkanlar, değerli katılımcılar, hanımefendiler, beyefendiler, şahsım ve ülkem adına 
Hepinizi saygıyla, sevgiyle selamlıyorum. Distinguished co-chair, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry. Thank you. Distinguished co-chairs, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, on my behalf and on, my, on behalf of my country, I would like to welcome each and every one of you. Artık şunu biliyor ve inanıyoruz ki nasıl bir dünya istiyoruz, nasıl bir ülke istiyoruz. Onun için bugün çocuk politikalarında nasıl bir çocuk politikası gidiyoruz ki geleceğin dünyasına dair hayallerimizi, hedeflerimizi oluşturabilelim. Now we're in an era where we know what type of a country do we want. We know what type of a globe and world do we want. And in that regard, in that perspective, we deploy our policies aiming at children. And that's how we shape, we try to shape our future. O yüzden 10 yıl önce biz iktidar olduğumuzda önce çocuk dedik. Ve bütün politikalarımızı, eğitimini önce çocuk, sağlıkta önce çocuk, Erişilebilirlikte önce çocuk, bütün politikalarımızı çocuğu merkeze alarak güncelledik. In that regard, 10 years ago, when we took office, when we came to government, we placed children to the core of our policies. And we had a motto, we said, first children. We gave, we gave priority to children in education, in health and in accessibility. Çocuklarımızı kendi içinde ayırmayacağız. Şu engelli, engelsiz bir bütün olarak bakacağız dedik ve engelli çocuklarımızın verdiğimiz hakları bir imtiyaz, bir lütuf değil, bir hak temelli yaklaşım olarak politikamızı ürettik. And what we said, we will not segregate and we will not differentiate between our children with or without disability. They are the same. We deployed a holistic approach and we said the rights that we attribute to children with disabilities will not be considered as concessions or as priorities. They will be the rights that they will fully enjoy as the other children. Özellikle çocuklarımızın yaşam hakkını, eğitim hakkını çok önemsedik. Ve bütün çocuklarımızın eğer yoksulluktan dolayı okumuyorlarsa, eğer engelinden dolayı okumuyorlarsa, bunların önündeki engeli kaldırdık. Bütün eğitim imkanlarını sosyal devlet olarak ücretsiz temin ettik. We attached greater importance on right to life and on right to education. And we had a look at the children that were out of school due to poverty, or if they were children that could not pursue their education due to their disabilities, we said we have to cast aside all barriers and we provided them with accessibility to schools without um, any charge as a requirement of a social state. Ekonomik olarak çocuklarımızı destekledik. Kız çocuklarına, erkek çocuklarından daha fazla mali destek verdik ve bunu anneye verdik. We pr provided financial supports to our children and the financial support given to children was higher in amount when uh, the girls were at stake and we delivered that financial support to the mothers. Benim ülkemde şu anda bütün çocuklar temel eğitimden yüzde 98 bu şekilde 98 buçuk bu şekilde eşit eğitim imkanı alıyor. Engelli ve engelsiz bütün çocuklarımız eğitim imkanına kavuşuyor. In my country, as of today, the uh, enrollment rate to basic education is 98.5%. All children with or without disability have the opportunity to enjoy their right to education on an uh, equal basis. İkinci başlık sağlık dedik. Şu an yine bizim ülkemizde doğan her çocuk sigortalı doğuyor ve 18 yaşına kadar bütün sağlık imkanlarından ücretsiz istifade ediyor. The second topic that we deemed necessary to be tackled was health. And we said we need to provide health insurance to each and every newborn baby. So today, the babies, when, are, when they are born, they have a health insurance coverage until the age 18. And that is free of charge yet again. 
Üzerinde çalıştığımız en önemli konu erişilebilirdik. Bugün engellilerimizin de içinde olduğu ve ülkemizin kapalı, açık, e, toplu taşıma sistemlerini engellilerimizin erişebileceği halde yeniden yapılandırıyoruz. Şehirlerimizi yeniden yapılandırıyoruz. The next topic that we uh, have to tackle is accessibility and this is one of the most important agenda of our country right now. Um, as of today, the persons with disability in Turkey have to have an accessibility in the country and we are um, exerting all possible efforts to um, restructure all mass transportation, all uh, open and closed areas in the public sphere uh, to be accessible to persons with disabilities. Koruyucu önleyici tedbirleri önemsiyoruz. Tedavi sistemlerini yeniden yapılandırıyoruz. Rehabilitasyon ve destek sistemini yeniden daha güçlü hale getiriyoruz. We do also attach importance to protective and preventive measures. We restructure uh, our treatment um, approaches and we do also have um, a, an, an additional um, rehabilitation on um, treatment um, activities as well. Bir konuyu daha çok önemsiyoruz. Teknolojik imkanlardan engelli çocuklarımızın istifade edebilmesi için tekno kamplar kurup çocuklarımızı teknolojik olarak da önlerindeki engelleri kaldırmaya çalışıyoruz. There is one additional um, area where we attach importance and it is to provide technological opportunities to children with uh, disabilities. Therefore, um, with that uh, aim in mind, we establish technological parks techno parks where we bring technological opportunities to children with disabilities. UNICEF ile beraber çalıştığımız programda da engelli ve engelsiz bütün çocuklarımızın öğretmenlerinin kaynaştırma eğitiminde anne babanın nelere dikkat etmesi gerektiği üzerinde güçlü bir program üzerinde kampanya çalışıyoruz. And in the field where we do collaborate with the UNICEF within the scope of a program we bring together the teachers the parents together um, within the scope of inclusive education and we focus on the areas uh, where we need to be careful, where we need to attach importance both for um, children with and without disability. Sözlerime son verirken bu nezih topluluğa bir şey ifade etmek istiyorum. Engellilikten şikayet ediyorsak eğer o çatışma ortamından ve savaşların biten bir savaşlardan Uzak bir dünyanın hedefine ulaşmamız gerekiyor. Çünkü her savaş birçok engelli çocuğun, birçok engelli insanın oluşmasına neden oluyor. Concluding my remarks, um, I would like to uh, touch upon one other point, distinguished um, audiences. Um, if we are today complaining about disability, uh, we have to bring an end to conflict zones, to conflicts and to uh, wars, because each and every conflict, armed conflict and war, causes higher numbers of uh, children with disabilities or um, adults. Birleşmiş Milletler çatısı altında savaşa hayır diyoruz ve dünya barışı için daha güçlü bir politika üretmeye bütün heyeti davet ediyoruz. Under the roof or under, under the auspices of the United Nations, we need to say no to war. We need to deploy a global policy to attain global peace and we have to be stronger and we would like to say no to war altogether. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your wonderful comments and your strong senses, sensibilities. And now I'd like to introduce the second person. His name is Peter Ochineng, and he works on the African Youth with Disabilities Network. And he has been very active in getting youth involved. And so I, I've asked him to make a couple of comments to this wonderful crowd. And are you, OK, he's coming up. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very honored and pleased to stand before you on such a day. My name is Ocheng Peter. 
a youth from Uganda. I work with African Youth with Disability Network, and I also work with National Union of Disabled Persons in Uganda. It is a very great pleasure to speak here before this congregation. I want to begin my presentation by this statement. You can speak for us and our voice may be heard, but when we speak for ourselves, action will be taken. And these are children's training. We always speak for children, but when we don't give them a chance to speak for themselves, nothing much is done. I think when we change to that mode, change will be seen in the lives of children. Now, um, I'm going to present on the second point. How can we engage children and adults in global partnership for children? One of, one of the major ways we can do this is by availing information to children. I'm very aware that this thing is going on here, but when you move around, few people know about it. When you go to area where technology is not there, no one is aware about it. They will see it in news, they will hear it. So how will they participate? How will they be engaged? So we have to avail information to them and to others such that they can be involved. We should also ensure protection to children. In some countries, when you, when you speak, or when children speak, they are harassed at the end. So as we're looking for these children, to interview them, to capture their videos, we should ensure that there is security for them and see that whatever they're going to do won't harm their lives. We should also train the adults. We should not leave aside their parents. In such a gathering, we can invite children with their parents and they learn. They see who is in favor of us. What are they doing? What are they saying? Children can say no. I was very happy to see my sister, Crystal, speaking. She represented the children and her voice was heard. So if we had very many children here, how would you be feeling and how could you be touched? We should also ensure that we use role models. Like for example, we've seen the video which has been played. We've seen Crystal. When we go to our consciences, we use those people to inspire others. This will motivate children to speak and to act on their behalf. We should use adults as a source of inspiration for their children. Should make parents love their children. We should show them that their children is a resource to the world, but not a burden to them, by supporting them in any way we can. And we should also shift from a more recent, a more, this kind of set of meetings, whereby we only gather in one place and the actual beneficiaries are outside there, not even aware of what we are thinking for them. No. How, when we are looking at directly consulting children on this issue, should answer some questions. Why, why, are we, why are we consulting them? Which age are we looking at? And when are we doing this? Are we waiting to, to consult them after the new millennium development goes to confirm with them whether it is fit for them? I think the time is now and they should act now. Now, about trying to form, to, to promote a global artistic expression on inclusion. I think here, the only way we can ensure this is by promoting the issue of role models. Because putting all the one billion people together 
may not be easy. But if we use role models, I think we can achieve much out of our consultation and what's going on. Thank you very much for the audience, and thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you, thank you very much for your comments, Peter. Really, they were very inspiring. And I agree with you. The youth, if this is a forum for youth, we should have youth here. I don't see that many here in the audience, so we need to work on that. We need to get more youth representatives here in person. So now we're gonna discuss the third topic, and I'm very pleased to introduce Ronaldo Villamoro. And he is a youth who focuses on working on youth and media and how we can raise awareness in regards to the media. And so I'd like to bring him to the podium. Hello. Standing in front of you is such a meaningful experience because I represent the voices of young people have this great passion for serving and working with persons with disabilities. I've been working with a lot of youth-run organizations in the Philippines, and we have a lot of interesting experiences why we decided to focus on advocacy campaigns. And we have two very interesting scenarios that we want to share. First is, we have a friend named Cheryl. She has congenital deformity. She has one arm, and she has one leg. Every time she goes around the city, she doesn't understand why people would stare at her and give her coins, even if she's not asking for those coins. Second situation, we started making a very little parade on the streets in my city. And when we brought all the children with disabilities on the streets, people were so shocked. In fact, one of the people approached me and said, why are you bringing these children out? Aren't you making them more vulnerable to ridicule? These scenarios actually teach us a lot of lessons, that physical rehabilitation is not enough. There should be social rehabilitation, or it means changing and shifting the paradigm of people about the concept of disability. This is the reason why, in our organizations in the Philippines, we establish a so-called advocacy program to make sure that we change the perspectives of young people and the people in the community. One of the programs that we have, and the most accessible one, is to organize a radio program. Because in a province where I come from, a lot of children with disabilities come from remote areas. And the only media that we can reach to their families is through radio. And then we realize that there should be involvement of the tri-media aside from the radio. So we organize TV programs, even print media, and all of these opportunities. It is also very important to note that creative activities in the community are very important to shift the paradigms of the people about disability. In a city where I come from, young people are so innovative Two years ago, we celebrated the National Autism Consciousness Week. People were so tired of doing parades on the streets. So what the peop young people did was that we organized a flash mob for autism in one of the malls, and then thousands of people were actually witnessing the event, and we had the same message, and that was to raise awareness about disability. And we also made sure that we include other people in the process of educating the community. The most important media nowadays is the social media. And I believe the young people, of course, I, incur I, I acknowledge the fact that mature people are into social media, but a lot of young people are very much inclined in social media. And social media is one of the things and one of the tools that we have to make use in order to shift the paradigms of the people about disability. Now, when we did all of these activities, it was very important that we need reflection. So what we did with the organizations where I was in was that we conducted an assessment process. This was in a form of survey, interviews with people in the, in the community to measure their level of awareness about disability. 
And then it was very interesting because in all the advocacy activities that we're doing in the city, a lot of positive things come in. Number one, a lot of parents voluntarily bring their children out from their homes. Many years ago, before we conducted advocacy activities, it was very hard for us to look for children with disabilities in the community because a lot of parents really had a hard time bringing them out because they think that their children you know, will be facing a lot of humiliation and ridicule in their society. And then after doing all of these series of advocacies, we realize that parents are become more aware and they do voluntarily bring their children out. Second, we realize that there's a change in terms of using inappropriate terms in the society. And one very important positive output that we've observed is that a lot of people are more interested into disability. In a city where I come from, we produce 500 special education students every year because more people are becoming more interested to work for children with disabilities. And all of these things, if we look at it, we generalize that advocacy activities actually serve this, um, different purposes based on the needs of the society. A radio, for example, is a very important tool for areas that are remote to educate families belonging to remote areas. Social media is a very important tool to make sure that we have an avenue for young people to push for something worth fighting for. And most importantly, activities like parades, flash mob for autism, these are creative activities that will unify the voices of those advocates so that it will become much stronger in terms of giving impact to the community. But at the end of the day, I realized that though media play a very important role in the advocacy for persons with disabilities, it still requires a collective effort. And as what the acronym TEAM exemplifies, T-E-A-M, together everyone achieves more. And as what young people usually say, let's bring it on. Thank you so much and good afternoon. Ronaldo, that was a great addition on your comments. It's so wonderful. And really, I feel like we've heard so many inspiring comments. And, and so I'm happy now to open the floor up to the audience to hear your thoughts and what key act actions we can do and key activities that we can take to make action for this plan. So please, feel free to raise your hand. Um, so if I may remind you, first, we are discussing how governments can honor to make, create more initiatives. So maybe does anyone have a specific comment about that area? Oh, I see somebody in the back. Yes, you. Yes. A microphone. Uh, thank you very much for the panel. And I'm really grateful for this opportunity. I'm Dr. Balogu Israel Adekunle from Challenge Your Disability Initiative, Bauchi, a volunteer there. I'm from Nigeria. Uh, I thought uh, Aja would be around to answer some of my questions because it's actually addressed towards uh, she is from my country. And I would like to ask the question generally now. What do you do when government are not willing to even put on their signature on legislation that will have to affect the lives of persons with disabilities. To, uh, this is the second time that the bill that will promote the right of persons with disabilities that agrees with the convention will be going before our president. And up to now, he has not assented to it. Uh, you know, uh, it's challenging when you can't hold government accountable because you don't have a legal means. So what do we do in such case? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think that's a, an important comment about human rights uh, with per persons with disabilities. All governments need to be advocating for human rights for all people. And so persons with disabilities fall into that. So I'll be sure to make note of that. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? I think one of the things is, as was 
ably demonstrated by Norway, I should say I'm Anne from New Zealand, um, is A, getting the political... <coughs> a, oh, sorry. A, getting the political will. B, uh, one of the things that has happened for us is the chief executive or the secretary of education, so the government department. And, second, and thirdly, I think the other thing is, as has been stressed, it can't work because you've got separate bits unless there is a commitment from government working cooperatively with persons with disabilities organisations and having a strong voice of people with disabilities and youth with disabilities so that the, the, the activities they put in place reflect the will of the people. So I think it's that tripartite approach that is so important. Thank you for that. Would somebody else like to add? They might write down a question on a yellow piece of paper. I was just going to say we um, have the possibility to receive questions from or comments from Danny Kay upstairs as well, so we'll check on that, yeah? That's right, Richard. Thank you. Hi, I, I am Dr. Manan. I am coming from Bangladesh. I work for the Global Autism Bangladesh. I think um, it was the, I will take a little time because it was the same situation in Bangladesh before three years. When we started the Global Autism campaign with the help of obviously the Prime Minister's daughter, Sama Wazed, uh, how we did it, it's an example now because in Bangladesh, when we started uh, the whole thing, the Disability Act was stuck before three years, what you said. And we started first with the awareness campaign with the public, because these people, these disabled people are a part of the country. You can't ignore them. This is the population. It doesn't matter which political party, which political ambition. They are the part of the country. And at the same time, we started making small trainings. Awareness started very small training awareness program for the politicians, for the policy makers, for the MPs, small groups. It takes time. But you can see the result that already Bangladesh proposed the Autism Act in UN last year. And already WHO accepted in executive committee, same the autism. It, it, it's a huge achievement. But we started from our country that you have to first make these people understand to be how it's, it is feeling to be a disabled people in their field, in their, in their shoe. So it's take time. And you'll be happy to know that this month, when we are speaking now, the Disability Act in Bangladesh is going to be passed within one week. Because obviously it's take time. But you have to be very cautious and you have to be working on it. And you have to train and make our the political peoples, the policy makers, others, first to understand. And when they understand, they become the advocate of the whole population that we are talking about. So it's, it's how just you started, and then you will see the result. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, so we are hoping to maybe get some of the discussion going about youth participation as well. So maybe... You have any, uh, does anyone here have any ideas how we can get youth more involved in participating? Yes, you. So, uh, my Over name here. is Victor. I am from World Blind Union. Um, you, yes. I want to make, I want oh, to make a, right here. No, right here. Yeah, I want to make a quick observation. I was training a group of people with disabilities in India on human rights, CRPD, and things like that. I was talking about awareness generation, raising the level of awareness and all. Suddenly, a youth with a disability stood up and said, can you please stop? See, there is an organization coming to my village since 10 years, and their message is clear and loud. You should not call people with disabilities by derogatory terms. You sh should call them by their real names. So even today, people call me in my village, lame fellow. 
One day, I was crawling on the road because wheelchair or tricycle doesn't work in my village. Road condition is not good. And one person came and said, Hey, lame fellow, where are you going? I said, What nonsense is this? What is this rubbish? I am not lame fellow. Your father is lame fellow. That is the last day. That is the last day. After that, nobody from my village addressed me as a lame fellow. What I am trying to say is, unless we people with disabilities equipped to resist, encounter, protest these attitudes, nobody on this earth, even so-called God can help to change the situation. I am not saying that awareness generation is not important. Awareness generation is important, but very important is we people with disabilities should be equipped to deal with these crippling negative attitudes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so now, yes, over here. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm Abhi Akram again from Pakistan. Uh, I just briefly said, like, we are talking about disability and young people's representation. Or I think this is our success. Like, everyone in the hall is talking about the youth with disabilities and children with disabilities. So how we can practically include them, like, through disabled people organizations? What is the role they are taking in all the implementation process? Secondly, we have a strong policy policies and commitments we have most of the countries have signed and ratified the UN convention on the rights of person with disabilities so we can strategically include these points in our policies and our documents so we can target more disabled persons all over the world and can engage the voices from the global south as well because they are the most vulnerable uh, so called you uh, can call them the marginalized or having triple kind of discrimination so engaging them in the political participation is also very important so for me like it's very important to uh, understand like how we can practically make the strategies to inclusion of young people with disabilities thank you thank you does somebody else want to speak we have it here and I have the gentleman over there right here I can't really see. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ring Arigan. I'm uh, the president of Safe Our Youth Curacao and uh, the founder of this foundation. I'm from Curacao. There are some government um, they want to understand, and there's some who don't want to understand. Why? Our experience is being almost 10 months that our organization asking for one appointment with the minister, the prime minister of Curacao. 10 months. We start at January this year, yeah, through the normal way. You go by the secretary to make appointment. Yeah. Are we going to call you? Okay, you come over two weeks, are we going to call you? And the third time we say, listen, uh, we came with third time. What's going on? No, no, no, no, the government is busy, uh, the minister is very busy with important things. I say, what? Important? These children are also important. Their parents, they don't have uh, much money, but they pay the tax, so they can pay the minister's salary and your salary. Oh, they've been punished for us now for a couple months, ignoring us. Right now, we have three big projects holding them back. One is a special uh, beach for people with disabilities, yeah, for the therapy. The government of Kiroso is holding them back. And I'm very happy to be here to share this with you guys. There's a lot of things being happening around the world, also in my country. One of them is taking the freedom of people with disability and they must be free to get their freedom back, their right to develop themselves and the talent, yeah? To have the opportunity Thank to you. participate in everything. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also, I would like to just give you guys a reminder, let's make sure we bring up ideas for activities and different actions that we can take place to implement in our action plan. Thank you.
Right here. Thank you, ma'am. This is Susan Seal, the CEO of Mobility International. And I would like to propose um, perhaps having another cluster group called uh, leadership training and mentoring to follow up on the idea of getting leadership training for people, young people with disabilities and giving them disabled mentors. Our organization has over 2,100 disabled people from over 110 countries who've gone through leadership training and over 200 disabled women who've gone through training. And I'd like to work with Rosangela and her wonderful staff and the folks at DPI who have also fabulous networks to add this cluster group. So we look forward to discussing those details with you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you. Okay, so the third topic of discussion that deals with the media and using the media to raise awareness. Does anybody have any ideas in that venue? Yes. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tabitha Nkunika. I'm coming from Zambia. I'm a group leader for self guests for the slow learners. Um, we, we, are in, we are involved in the, the media. We, we are free to use it any time in Zambia, and we, we give out any issues over so far for gates and we have group meetings every month. Thank you. Great, thank you. The next person that would like to speak over here? Yes, you. Great. always about children uh, and not the, the subgroup or group juice. Uh, and I think that should be spelled out. If you read there, it says children and adults, children, youth, and adults. I think youth is a very powerful group. Uh, they are the new voters. Politicians are looking at young people because they are going to vote for them. I come from Chile. Education is a big topic. Why? Because the young people are out in the streets making it uh, very visible in an election year. Uh, young people with disabilities, I mentioned before, the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network has changed the conversation in the United States uh, around the needs and wants of the autistic community. So I truly believe youth are uh, very much in the social media. They are connected and they should connect the different disabilities. And I'm so glad, but I would suggest that in all documents says children, youth, uh, or, or global partnership for children and youth, or somehow, uh, I mean, teenagers don't want to be called children. Uh, so the whole group of adolescents are falling through the cracks here. Uh, until 18 years old, 17 years old, doesn't want to be called children. Thank you for that. And, and yes, you? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm so happy to be here. My name is Amna Alispahic and I'm from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, so uh, we have been talking about children with disabilities, youth with disabilities, empowering and the media. Uh, I just uh, want to say briefly that the empowering of people with disabilities is the most important thing. Uh, that in Bosnia and Herzegovina, empowering of people with disabilities, young people with disabilities, resulted in the code uh, that deals with the question how to present persons with disabilities in the media. Because, as you all know, the media needs miracles. The media needs persons with disabilities to present them very often in a wrong way. So what we did, we published the code on presenting persons with disabilities. And not to take so much time from you, I just want to uh, say idea uh, of our code. It is the way you address me, that way you see me. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. And the next person I saw, yes, over here. Thank you. Um, my name is Hitomi Honda. I'm from World Vision International. And it's really great to hear that um, about this um, uh, not leaving anyone behind and also engaging young people with disabilities, including or using these uh, social media. And the point that I would like to raise is that we should be very, very concerned about those people who are living in remote area, not just in rural area, but remote areas where they have no, not even computer, but definitely no um, electricity. They have no information. They don't even know that the uh, rights of people with disabilities exist. So uh, as we talk about this important agenda, and talking about girls with disabilities, youth with disabilities, people with different kinds of disabilities, we really want to make sure that um, people with disabilities in remote areas are included. And that includes engagement of these people with disabilities in DPO activities. We see a huge gap between DPOs in the capital, in big cities, but in rural, remote areas, Again, people are not even aware of the CRPD. So I think we need to be really concerned as we talk about action plans. Thanks. Thank you for that, yes. And I saw somebody in the back over here. Yes. Um, hello, my name is Ana Maria Rodriguez. I'm from Colombia. I uh, just want to go back to the recommendations for how government can take action um, to include in our action plan. And I think um, to be very strategic, governments have the abil ability of investing a lot of resources in the technical and admin capacities to actually help gather data on who people, children, youth, adolescents with disabilities are, where they are. And the more data we have, the more informed public policies we can make or inclusive policies we can make in our countries. Thanks. Thank you, thank you very much. And so I think due to time constraints, we're probably coming to an end. Is that right, Richard? Sure, sure, let's have about one or two more comments. So I saw some hands, yes, you over there. First of all, con congratulations. My name is Livio Olteanu. I'm a secretary general of inter Association for the Defense of Legal Liberty for Switzerland. We organize our organization here in States uh, in the time of uh, Madame Roosevelt, who was the first president of our uh, organization. He congratulations because all of us, we are media. Um, I think the real disability of our world is when we are absent, when we don't take care of the needs of the children, of the needs of the youth, I remember for this session, very interesting session, what uh, told us Amina, or the minister for Nor from Norway, everywhere, everyone needs more specific solutions to make us more co coordinated. We are interested to keep uh, the momentum. E education is, th is the key. How can we help others, first of all, to be aware that there are some needs? How can we do that? By media, because all of us, we are the media. Thank you so much. Thank you, and our last person over here. Uh, my name is Joyce Malombe. I wanted to make a, um, a comment about the, uh, a number of us are talking about governments resisting this, and everybody has been talking about this at least for the last 15 to 20 years. And uh, so we give lip service to the issue of people with disabilities and especially children who cannot speak for themselves. And I am wondering whether we don't need international pressure for governments to do this. I think we have to work from the bottom up and also from the top up. How are we going to, to make this an issue that will make governments ashamed that they are doing nothing about this? How do we make this being a human rights issue? Uh, the, most of the other issues have champions who champion for that cause and get people actually to act and make those who are not acting actually embarrassed. 
And so I'm just appealing to the UN and the other bodies that are here and the governments that are actually doing this. We can no longer keep one billion people under the radar. We have to move and move quickly. And we have to stop from talking to actually putting money into the issue of disability and giving it visibility. I believe that disabled people are doing a lot in their countries, but as somebody mentioned here, we need to build leaders. We need to be strategic about getting leaders who can articulate this issue, put it on the table, and make the governments and everybody not forget about the issue. So as we move from here, I am encouraged by the discussion, but we have had very many of these. What are we going to do differently tomorrow? and change the issue of people with disabilities. Thank you, thank you. And maybe we can have actually one last comment. Yes, go ahead. Hello, um, I am Sagar. I am representing University of Massachusetts, Boston today. I'm originally from Nepal and in my country, uh, children with disabilities, even people with disabilities have very uh, a hard life, uh, even like fighting to get basic services like health and like getting to toilet, education. So I, I want to like share my experience of media uh, raising the awareness for disability. I write, I um, actually write a, a monthly column in a national newspaper in my country. And media, I, I have found that past in these past two or three years, since we are writing articles, me, my colleagues, and other youths with disabilities are writing everything, every articles, uh, monthly, weekly, in these newspapers. And these have a positive impact in, in the general people, like in our society. And what we did was like we organized a media competition in my, in my organization at Nepal. I was working at Water Aid International in Nepal. So we organized this competition that for media people Th that who would write a good story about people with disabilities. And there were so many stories a uh, whole month, uh, like maybe they were uh, wanting to win the prize, but, but that, that make a very uh, a, a good stories. There were lots of good stories, good case, case studies that was brought into light to the government people, to all people, and that, that really, that was fruitful for all of us. So yes, I want to just, uh, highlight the use of media. Media can do anything. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. So I think we're going to wrap this up, but if we weren't able to get your comments during this session, please feel free to write them on the jot cards, and we will, we will be sure to carry them on through. So thank you again for your comments. I enjoyed moderating this discussion and being a part of it. So thank you so much. And now I'd like to bring Richard to the podium. Can I thank uh, Jenny first of all? Could we give her another round of applause? It's fantastic. It's great. I, I think you noticed Jenny uh, co-moderated without any notes. I have pages of notes. So Jenny <laughs> managed to do it without any notes. So I'm very impressed. Um, but uh, seriously, I, th I think it's been extremely valuable hearing your uh, voices and getting your inputs in, in this session. We've had uh, a number of examples from different countries, which is very important. But we've also heard from you, your experiences, your struggles, the struggles you go through, the strategies you use in those struggles uh, to, to make progress in, in your societies and in your situations. And this is all ex extremely valuable. So I know that the Secretariat will be taking all these different inputs from the jot cards, from the uh, postcards, from the discourse in this session, from the presentations, uh, to synthesize into a draft action plan that will be shared uh, for comments. Um, I, I want to say, uh, personally, I'm really struck by um, the complexity of the challenge and the struggle for the rights of, of children with disabilities, children including adolescents, adolescents and young people, as was pointed out. I know this intellectually, um, but it, it is a different thing to be educated by you about all the different dimensions of exclusion on the one hand and inclusion on the other hand. 
because both of these are, are, are very complex and uh, take place in many different spaces in society, in the home, in relation to school, in relation to government organizations, natural resources, public services, the private sector, and, and so on, and so on. To me, the bottom line, and I'm going back to what Amina was saying, because this is familiar to me, if we all agree that no one must be left behind in the new agenda, then the success or failure of countries and of our global humanity has to be measured by whether we include those people who are most excluded. And specifically to us here now, whether those people, including young people who are struggling for their rights, persons with disabilities, whether they will say, yes, for the first time in history, we are included. We feel ourselves included. We know ourselves included. We feel that equally with other members of our societies, we are able to realize our rights. It's only when persons with disabilities, including young people, say that to all of us, that we will be able to say that the next development agenda and the present one is achieving success. Unless that is said to us by persons with disabilities that, they, that you are included and they are included for the first time uh, on an equal basis, then we can't say that the development agenda is becoming successful. For children and young people specifically, you've given us many examples of how to include their voices, their concerns, their interests, and how to address their rights. Ways in which children's voices can be enhanced. Ways in which society, including all social institutions in, like media and, and movements, can mobilize in the interests of children uh, and young people with disabilities and how they themselves can mobilize. I would come back to saying that for me, I was taught this when I started to learn about human rights uh, in the 1990s when the Convention on the Rights of the Child came into force, that human rights is a combination of two things, dialogue and struggle. A dialogue such as we are having here today in, in this forum, in this meeting. Struggle, as was described by colleagues in, in uh, the, the meeting who talked about the difficulty, the challenge of even getting an appointment with a government minister, let alone getting legislation formulated and passed in conformity with uh, equal rights for persons with disabilities. These are examples of struggle and then we heard examples of strategies by which struggle could take place to get those appointments, to get mobilization in society, and to get legislation formulated and passed. I want to suggest that the struggle and the dialogue is made up of uh, a, an integrated approach of different elements, changing of attitudes, making discrimination and exclusion socially unacceptable, culturally unacceptable, politically unacceptable. You would know better how to go about that shift, that fundamental change in attitudes, but I believe it has to happen because it happened for children, it happened uh, for racial equality and civil rights, it happened uh, for the, the equal rights of, of women and gender equality. It has to happen and has begun to happen for the rights of, of persons with disabilities. So cultural and social and political attitudes changing. Legislation and then legislation using the convention, the CRPD, as leverage. This is very important as a tool and, and you all know that as well as I do. We have learned in the child rights movement the, the, the value and the power of having a convention on the rights of children. It has given us tremendous leverage that we didn't have before over government policy uh, to encourage, to um, assess performance, to know whether governments are in compliance with the obligations they have assumed voluntarily. And then the programs and the budgets and the policies that 
put into practice those laws which are on paper and are on the books. Those books have to be translated into realities of resources being made available and people being able to claim their rights, persons with disabilities. So this is all about a big fundamental social transformation that would enable persons with disabilities to claim their rights. And the final thought I had, and I just talked a little bit about this with Rosangela, is whether there could be an index of inclusion. We've used indices in other areas, like uh, gender equality, children's rights, um, developing a set of criteria, probably not too many, but some core criteria based, for example, on the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, including in countries that haven't yet ratified the Convention, but an index of whether society is including persons and young people with disabilities. That's the kind of thing that could be used to assess performance, to encourage governments to take action, but also to put pressure on governments by making comparisons between countries, some doing better, others not doing so well, identifying the areas in which your country or countries need to do better, and then looking at progress on that index over time in order to encourage countries that are trying to do better. This is the kind of thing that might be useful in order to put that pressure on that many of you talked about. Um, the final thing I want to say, somebody was saying who are the champions for the rights of children and persons with disabilities. I hope, Rosangela, I can say that UNICEF will be among the champions. We will do our very best to be an effective partner uh, in the struggle for the rights of persons with disabilities. Again, thank you very much to the organizers. Thank you to Jenny so much for co-moderating and I hope this has been a useful session for all of us. I understand there is a short video coming. Voices of children. The Voices of Children. Thank you. Thank you. And if you could stay for the video. Thank you very much. UNICEF logo. UNICEF logo. Once Disabilities time, unit logo. Goes. When I grow up, I want to be a pilot. The thing that I want to be when I grow up is a meteorologist. A doctor or a policeman. And he was lucky enough to have access to a chef or a dentist. She went to school. Children with disabilities from around the world in classrooms. Where she was able to learn. In sign language, for me, children's rights means deaf and hearing children have the same opportunities to go to school. Parents shouldn't hide their children with disabilities at home. They should take them to school. I have the right to go to school. Instead to be treated, to study music, to do physical exercise, to go out with friends. Whatever the conditions and services are like in those care homes, nothing can replace a family. Treat us equally. Value us for who we are and what we can do, not how we look like and what we can't do. In sign language, sometimes people think we're beneath them, and that's not true. She became vulnerable to neglect, violence, abuse, and exploitation. She is teased at school. Her society wasn't prepared for her, and now she's on the fringes of it. Now a young woman, she begs in the streets. But hold on a moment. What if, instead of abandoning that girl, we invested in her? The mother steps on a landmine, but the baby survives and is fitted with a wheelchair. What if we said no to stigma and discrimination? As a young girl, she eats with her family at the table. What if we cost-effectively gave her access to water, sanitation, and hygiene? And made sure she could attend the same school as her peers without disabilities? 
she uses an accessible toilet and speaks with her friends at school. She graduates and becomes a doctor. Well, I'd call that a good investment. Because the cost of exclusion is higher than the cost of inclusion. Let's build an inclusive society, together. UNICEF. Invest in children. UNICEF logo. Disabilities unit logo. When I grow up, I want to be a pilot. The thing that I want to be when I grow up is a meteorologist. I'd like to become a teacher or a policeman. A chef. Or a dentist. Children with disabilities from around the world in classrooms. I especially want to uh, underscore the importance of the wrap-up session, which articulated, I think, really very, very well um, the elements that are going to be needed to really uh, inspire the thinking and on, on what, we, what needs to be done over the next two years. So a lot of that will definitely appear in the 2013-2015 work plan. So once again, for all the speakers in that fabulous session, I, I just think it's fabulous. Now, and for each of you who made huge contr contributions from the floor, um, you, we all deserve a coffee break, basically, <laughs> is where we're headed now. But I must say, we are really pushed for time, so I'm going to ask only that you take a 10-minute break to go and get your coffee or your tea or whatever and bring it back in so we can get started at 4 o'clock, 4 o'clock sharp on the last session of the day. Thank you very much. UNICEF logo. Disabilities unit logo. When I grow up, I want to be a pilot. The thing that I want to be when I grow up is a meteorologist. I'd like to become a teacher or a policeman. A chef. Or a dentist. Children with disabilities from around the world in classrooms. Where she was able to learn in a safe environment, form friendships that last a lifetime, and realize her dreams. A young girl growing up with her friends, and then graduating from high language. school. For me, children's she rights means deaf and hearing children the second girl was born have to the a same opportunities to go to school. Parents shouldn't hide their children with disabilities at home. But her they should take them to school. And her I have the right to go to school. Instead of receiving love and to be treated, to study music, to do physical exercise, to go out with friends. Whatever the conditions and services are like in those care homes, nothing can replace a family. Treat us equally. Value us for who we are and what we can do, not how we look like and what we can't do. In sign language, sometimes people think we're beneath them. Sometimes I'm not having it as easy as people think I am. Just have to push hard. I think there's a difference between sympathy and empathy. People are being sympathetic. You make me feel like I can't do anything. My lifetime package is osteogenesis imperfecta, a genetic disorder that makes my bone fragile and easy to be broken. I want people to see me as a girl who's vulnerable physically but can be hard to break mentally at the same time. My disability hasn't stopped me from doing anything. It is necessary to go outside and show others that you exist. It is necessary to enjoy life without worrying about what someone might think of you, or what someone might tell you, or how someone might look at you. I am moving together with the world, because disability is not inability. Children with disabilities playing sports, making music and acting.
In sport or anything you do, the most important thing is to work hard and be honest. Once you do that, you'll be able to get better at it. Children with disabilities deserve and are entitled to everything. Boom! Nothing about us without us!